Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm going to play with my light because there we go. No, that's there we go. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. This is Left Bank Books Welcomes author, professor, and St. Louis native Kyle Beachy, who will discuss his new book, The Most Fun Thing Dispatches from a Skateboard Life. Tonight, Beachy will be in conversation with St. Louis novelist and publisher Danielle Dutton. Left Bank Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the supporters of Kyle and Danielle, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. We offer curbside pickup and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. We are happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoy this event, and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing a signed copy for you or for all of your friends at left-bank.com. Kyle was so nice to send us signed book plates, so we are able to offer signed copies for you to purchase. Purchasing a copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating, and it allows us to keep this event series going. So thank you for your support. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We will be taking questions from you at the end of the event, so you can type your questions as a comment, and you can do that at any point in time throughout the course of the event, and we will get to them towards the end of the hour. Be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook and YouTube to be notified about all of, all of our fantastic virtual events. Our fall schedule is packed with incredible events for readers of all ages. Now about tonight's book. Most fun thing, dispatches from a skateboard life. Perfect for fans of barbarian days, this memoir and essays follows one man's decade-long quest to uncover the hidden meaning of skateboarding and explores how the search led unexpectedly to insights on marriage, love, loss, American invention, and growing old. In, in January 2012, creative writing professor and novelist Kyle Beachy published one of his first essays on skate culture, an exploration of how Nike's corporate strategy successfully gutted the once mighty independent skate shoe market. Beachy has since established himself as skate culture's freshest, most illuminating, and at times most controversial voice writing candidly about the increasingly popular and fast-changing pastime he first picked up as a young boy and has continued to practice well into adulthood. What is skateboarding? What does it mean to continue skateboarding after the age of 40, four decades after the kickflip was invented? How does one live authentically as an adult while staying true to a passion cemented in childhood? How does skateboarding shape one's understanding of contemporary American life? of growing old and getting married. Contemplating these questions and more, Beachy offers a deep exploration of a pastime often overlooked, regularly maligned, whose seeming simplicity conceals universal truths. The most fun thing is both a rich account of a hobby and a collection of the lessons skateboarding has taught Beachy and what it continues to teach him as he struggles to find space for it as an adult, a professor, and a husband. Michael Christie, the author of Greenwood and If I Fall, If I Die, says, reading the most fun thing is the most fun thing that this reader has done in months. Kyle Beachy knows his skateboarding, but has even more to say about urban design, literary theory, marriage, the struggle for selfhood, the long overdue exorcism of skate culture's misogyny and bigotry, and the eternal knife fight between capitalism and community. With an, with an omnivorous and probing intelligence, Beachy views our tattered world through the scratched fisheye lens of a skateboarder and find jewel, finds jewels of truth hidden everywhere he looks. About tonight's speakers. Kyle Beachy's first novel, The Slide, won the Chicago Reader's Best Book by a Chicago Author Reader's Choice Award for the year. His short fiction has appeared in journals including Fanzine, Pank, Hobart, Juked, the Collagist, Five Chapters, and others. His writing on skateboarding has appeared in The Point, The American Reader, The Chicagoan, Free Skateboard Magazine, The Skateboard Mag, Jinkum, Jinkum, Deadspin, and The Classical. He teaches at Roosevelt University in Chicago and is a co-host 
on the skateboarding podcast Vent City with pro skater Ryan Lay and others. And tonight, Kyle will be in conversation with Danielle Dutton. Danielle is the author of Margaret the First, Sprawl, and Attempts at a Life. Her writing has also appeared or is forthcoming in the Paris Review, Harper's, The White Review, Fence, Bomb, and others. She is on the faculty of the writing program at Washington University in St. Louis and is co-founder and editor of the feminist press, Dorothy, a publishing project. And now, without further ado, if you'd please help me in welcoming our fantastic guests for the evening, we have Kyle Beachy and Danielle Dutton for Left Bank Books. Hello. Hi. Thanks, Hi. Shane. Thank Thanks, you. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Kyle. So I think we're just going to start. Thanks again, Shane. Um, See ya. Uh, we'll just start with you reading a little bit from the book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll read a little bit, but not very long. Okay. Because I know how that goes. I like well, reading. We, I yeah. guess I'm just old and uncool, but I really like reading. So do read you? as long as you want. Yeah, I legitimately do. Well, kudos to you. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read short so that we might we might talk longer. And in any case, um, so for those who don't know, uh, hello everyone uh, who's here, um, including dear old friends who have just texted me to say they're gonna be here. Um, this is a book that is comprised of um, sort of two types of chapters and. Uh, the the sort of body of the text is um, essays or articles that I wrote um, that are essentially like criticism of some object of skateboard culture. Um, and then the second half of the book uh, uh, seems to be a little bit more personal. Um, and what I'm going to read are is um, chapter nine, which involves a very familiar drive from Chicago to St. Louis, where I grew up. So uh, this chapter is called On This Ugly World. On December 14th, 2012, I drove the familiar 292 miles from Chicago to St. Louis with a friend of mine named Maggie, who I had known for years but had spent very little time with alone. I was driving down for the premiere of a local skate film the following night, and she was visiting family. If I recall, we left early enough to beat Chicago's outbound Friday traffic on I-55. It was raining and I don't think either of us knew what to say for those first hundred or so miles, so we didn't say much. Earlier that morning, a young man had shown up at an elementary school in Newtown, Connecticut, to shoot and kill 20 children between six and seven years old, along with six adults. We listened to NPR and kept the fan churning against the windshield fog. I had my big dog in the back seat, and she kept checking to see if Maggie and I were okay. This dog, man, she knew things. Her radar for human shock and sorrow was remarkably well-tuned, and her teeth back then hadn't gone yet, so the breath of her panting was only hot, not sour. She sat forward with her legs just behind the center console, sometimes licking my face, sometimes resting her head on my right shoulder. The radio kept saying the same words about a tight-knit community and the massacre in its heart. Rain thumped onto my Ford's roof and brake lights glowed ahead. We would shift for a time to music until it felt wrong, then return to NPR to hear the same interviews or interviews so substantively similar that there was no telling one from the other. The community, we heard, will have to pull together and move on. Once we did begin speaking, the circumstances led us to talk in ways that Maggie and I never had and haven't since. In fact, when I saw her the following night at the premiere, we steered fairly clear of each other. But for those three hours, we spoke at first sparingly, and then in torrents as thick as the rains, spoke frankly and without any of the normal guidelines. She spoke openly of her long-term boyfriend and whether they'd get married, the concerns she had, and the source of those concerns that traced deep into her past. I spoke of Kay, who, had, who I'd been dating for a year and assumed I'd marry, though why, why marriage, I wasn't sure. We confessed and spoke of arguments and sex, deep and secret fears. I know that I cried at least twice and would like to say, without it sounding dramatic, that we could have spoken of anything inside that car. The three of us were a family, and we spoke as a defense against the death cult of the country whose so-called heart we were driving through. 
The conversation might have led to any outcome. We might have skidded into traffic or pulled over and stepped nakedly out into the storm, veered wildly off course and started over with a shared life or two entirely new and separate lives. None of that happened. The dog kept us safe, and I dropped Maggie off at her parents and saw her the following night at a nightclub that was filled to capacity for the premiere. And what I'd like to say here is that the energy inside that crummy-ass two-bit club was uncannily similar to what we'd experienced in the car. It was a family. Pain and loss and catastrophe were only rumors delivered from some distant planet. The whole of the outside world stood in stark opposition to the interior world of skateboarding. Looking back now, it does seem that this was my biggest confusion during my early attempts at writing my life's fun thing. The world I knew was ugly. Skateboarding, I believed, was beautiful. Nigel Houston's affront was a matter of cold efficiency out of place. Nike's scheme was an invasion. Skateboarders had been dazzled by sh shiny trinkets and wooed by extra legroom on flights abroad. There is a barely hidden wish for revelation that I hear when I look over these early chapters, an old hope for a kind of reverse rapture whereby all but the most devout are taken away. Thanks. Excellent job. Oh, thanks. It's always weird to read when you can't actually like see the people reacting and smiling and clapping for you. So yeah, Excellent. thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I, I'm not going to talk like if we just met in a room and we were going to talk about your book, I have all these things I want to tell you about that I'm not going to like actually get into right now, but I do want to say this one thing as a way of starting, which is um, that I grew up around skateboarders um, mm -hmm. and I have been on skateboards, but I don't think you could say that like I ever rode a skateboard. Um, but I grew up in California in the 80s and early 90s and I was around a lot of skateboarders, like a lot. There, um, The town I grew up in in California was skateboard heavy. Um, and well, so where was it? Where was it in California? It's a town nobody's ever heard of called Visalia. It's in the Central Valley and there's like... Okay. Um, it's agricultural, but it's still yeah. California. Um, and anyway, so what was so amazing to me about your book is that it's, and this piece that you just read, I think encapsulates it so well, is that there's like, there's all this commentary about your life as a writer and writing in general that I really enjoyed as a writer could follow really easily. Um, and there's like, uh, like Shane sort of got up this, this political, the political um, aspects of, of skateboarding that I thought were really interesting. Um, and then like the world at large there's it's like a very philosophical book and then there's just all this skateboarding stuff in there too and it was so <laughs> interesting to me having always been on very much on the outside of skateboarding culture even um i think maybe because for some gender reasons like it was pretty a pretty macho scene that i was familiar right. with um at that time and um and so i feel like i can i have so many questions and they're going to go in a lot of different directions but i think i might start with like a very timely and obvious one um which is that while i was reading your book the olympics were on and yeah. i was i was visiting in california so i was back home in this place where i grew up with a lot of like pretty macho rough skaters mm -hmm. um and i was at my mom's house and she has a tv and the olympics were on and i was like literally it would be on on the side um playing as i was reading your book and i kept just i was like dying to know what you thought of, of skateboarding at the olympics skateboarding being at the olympics for the very first time um because to me what i was seeing on the olympics so i had basically tuned out skateboarding since like 1994 um sure. when i left home or whatever um and i was just like what is this i i was like totally shocked by the skateboarding at the olympics and i think yeah. it might just be because i've been so out of touch with skateboarding for so long but um i have all these things i wrote down that you said in the book that make me think i could guess what you thought of skateboarding at the olympics but i'd rather you just talk about it for a while and like what does it mean for skateboarding going forward or for yeah. you like yeah yeah so I mean, that's a that's a good question. It's a, it's a giant question, which is great. So I'll just talk now for the next forty five minutes or so. Um, the 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 first thing to note is that like if if you tuned out of skateboarding in nineteen ninety four, like you t you tuned out from um, a time when you know skateboarding was was pretty much full of like experimentation and failure, right? Like people didn't land things a lot 
in the early 90s. Like what a, what a lot of the early 90s was, was kind of discovering how to flip the bo- board, how to flip the board into positions so that it would grind and slide in new and exciting ways. Um, but aesthetically, like it wasn't beautiful. Like, skateboarding in the early 90s was, was a pretty sort of hideous thing. Um, which coincides, you know, with the time when it was at the most outcast kind of in terms of popular culture. Like it was not a cool thing to do in the early 90s. Um, so, so yeah, it would it would be a big it would be a big shock, I imagine, if you hadn't paid any attention since 1994 to see in 2021 um, this gleaming. Uh, if sort of insipid and sterile Olympic course with its its beautiful sort of um, purpley pink hues and gold colors and it was it was very well presented it, again if sort of sterile um, so like aesthetically it was very different right like the skaters you saw were wearing obviously they were wearing uh, uniforms because that's what we do now we wear our nation's uniforms um, but they were also like they weren't the outcasts, right? Like some of probably what you picked up on and seeing Olympic skaters were like, oh gosh, these people are sort of beautiful. Like, oh gosh, these aren't the like weird acne outcast, um, you know, sort of like indoor kids or whatever we used to call like kids who were drawn to skateboarding. Um, it's, it's different. It's a very different vibe than it was in the early nineties when I was skateboarding and you were probably like looking at your, your peers in Visalia and being like, Oh, these, fuck, these guys. Um, so a big difference, a big change. And one of the big changes that came about in those sort of 20 some years, early thirties is, um, skaters got a lot better. Right. And so the, the, the big thing for competitive skateboarding is that it took a long time for skaters to be good enough so that they could stand alone as the sort of entertainment. Right. Like what you saw in 1994, if you shown a live NBC broadcast, international broadcast on them, it would just be a, a raging failure. But in fact, skaters now are very good at what they do um, and they're able to perform spectacular feats like on command. Um, now, what that means for what the Olympics was and skateboarding going forward, uh, I think that's a lot trickier. Like my my kind of gut personal reaction to skateboarding in the Olympics was that men were incredibly boring and unexciting. Um, not very much like what I think of when I think of skateboarding. Um, and the women competition was beautiful and lively and full of hope and promise for the future. And that's pretty much it. Like the men felt terminal and as if we were at the end of a very long line and have arrived at a kind of boring state. And the women seemed like they were, they were full of promise and potential for the future of skateboarding. Like, I think the future of skate um, is not the most spectacular trick down the biggest rail. Like we we've seen that like skateboarding has seen that and it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't open a door to an interesting future. Um, Whereas the kind of future that is inclusive and finds underrepresented, traditionally underrepresented people engaging in skateboarding is incredibly exciting and promising and, and, you know, full of life. Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, one of the things that surprised me was, I mean, based on like when I left in 1994, it was just that um, there was this diversity that just had been like zero, um, right. and, but also given the place that I grew up. Um, but just like <laughs> following up on everything you just said. So I love this line. It's on page 164 in your book. I'm quoting you, Kyle. You say, <laughs> organized competition regulates and manages desire flattening it from the spikes and troughs of human behavior into a form more predictable, which is to say useful, which is to say harvestable, profitable, or if you like, exploitable. And I think that was the line I kept thinking about when I was wondering what you made of the Olympics. Like if you felt that sort of that energy or the desire or like if it felt like skateboarding to you, like what skateboarding is to you, if it felt like that to you up on the screen or if it, I mean, yeah. yeah. what it what it felt like to me was um it, a, again a sort of very neatly packaged and um uh, you know i mean it felt sterile it felt um it felt like a a, a thing to sell a thing to mm-hmm. sell you know everything from wheaties to 
energy drinks to NBC's own broadcast. Right? I mean, the only reason the Olympics is there is because the IOC needs life to continue supporting their mission of global licensing domination, right? Like it's not, it's not a secret why corporations come to skateboarding. Corporations come to skateboarding, companies' interests come to skateboarding because skateboarding has access to a youthful market. Like that's it. Um, it's not because they think skateboarding is a beautiful blend of physical uh, activity and, you know, perceptual grace. Like that's not what they're interested in. What they're interested in is access to a market. And, you know, in a certain sense, they got it. You know, the downside was that the Olympics kind of writ large were kind of a, a ratings failure this year. Um, and frankly, the way they presented skateboarding was about as unexciting as possible. Like, yeah, they... well, that's... go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I remember when they added snowboarding and it actually right. felt like, whoa. I mean, like if you hadn't seen snowboarders before, they seemed kind of crazy and it still felt like it felt kind of electric to me. And I remember the snowboarders themselves seemed kind of punk rock compared to some of the other athletes or whatever, like what we were used to at the Olymp like our Olympic heroes. And yeah. I didn't like, I wasn't getting those vibes from skateboarding and maybe it was the <laughs> set. I want to call it a set. I don't know what that to call the place they were skating, but it, yeah, it was like kind of brutalist sanitized. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, whatever, whatever. I mean, we don't have to talk about the Olympics all night, but I was. Well, no, yeah, but, but I think what I would add to that is that like, you know, I'm, I'm going to say a thing here about like stoners. And I think like snowboarders, <laughs> even when they're not in the Olympics, remain like just kind of stoners. And they're, you know, they're they live at the mountain and they they breathe the mountain and they go up and down the mountain. Um, and they do their very gymnastic sort of maneuvers on the mountain. Um, and they they're doing it all in states where lead is, weed is totally legal. Like the thing about skateboarders who are in the Olympics, um, for the most part, that's a different class of skater than um, the sort of skaters who hang out smoking weed at the skate park or you know even more so not at the skate park right i mean there's a real division in skateboarding between people who want to go to skate parks and engage with the sort of experience that a skate park gives us and people who would just stay completely away from skate parks and just want to go into the street and just want to be kicked out by security guard after security guard and move through downtown and navigate traffic and do the sort of um, movements that, you know, bring that sort of life of like engaging with the city. Um, and so already like there is a class of skater that didn't exist in 1994. And that class of skater is essentially like a gained athlete. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I don't know why that's not the case with snowboard. You know, like the snowboarders, they were out there, they were like pants sagging in the Winter Olympics. They were like throwing up like devil horns. They were like, whoa, this shit's crazy. <laughs> Where the skaters are like for the most part, they were sort of jockey. I mean, the good thing that you saw that was really endemic to skateboarding and natural to skateboarding was the fun and the support. And you saw that a lot more, I think, with the women's side of the competition. Like they yeah. were friends, they were having fun. The guys sort of were taking it super seriously and being like jockey about it to use uh -huh. 1994 language. They were being sort of jockey. Mm -hmm. Ooh, okay. I have questions about seriousness that we'll maybe sure. get to if we don't. I'm actually gonna completely change gears because I don't wanna like run out of time to talk about riding, which is like the thing that I don't I don't really know anything about skateboarding, which is probably sure. already abundantly clear. Um, <laughs> But I learned a bunch of stuff and I looked up a bunch of people, like, especially when you used to talk about like the most beautiful person to ever ride a skateboard. I was like, well, now I got to go check that out. But, um, okay. I want to actually talk about narrative. Um, mm -hmm. so we're two fiction writers here. Um, and I'm really, I have actually like a series of different questions I want to ask you about narrative, but to start, so I'm, I'm completely changing gears. I want to actually ask you about this line on page 18 in your book, where you say that skateboarding, like poetry, is structurally meaningless, and that contained in or implied by the structural meaninglessness is a quality of non-narrativity. So before we talk about narrative, can you unpack that a little bit more for us? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so a great deal of what the process of writing this book has been is trying to understand what exactly skateboarding is, right? Um, 
just on a very, very simple level, right? And and that comes from all sorts of things. And the main thing it comes from is, oh, hey, here's this thing I've done for 30 some years um, that seems to exist in my life in a totally separate column from all of these other things I've done, right? Like I have written short stories. I have um, written a novel. I have um, written, you know, teaching statements so that I can get a job and I have moved my way into the academy and, and kind of gotten tenure and done all of these things. And then there's this other thing that seems to stand a hundred percent apart from all of that. Um, and so a, a great deal of what this book grows out of is a kind of like basic curiosity. Like what have I been doing all these years? Like what, what exactly have I been up to when I haven't been writing another novel and when I haven't been, um, you know, preparing a, a new class or whatever the, the case may be, there's this whole other set of activities that I do um, that, you know, on a basic kind of economic uh, analysis, don't make a lot of sense professionally. Like, it, Wait, it, can it, I it, interrupt you? Yeah. How, and I don't know if this is like a weird or rude question, but like, how often do you skate? Um, like right day? now? Any time, no, anywhere between like th one to five times a week. Okay. Like I went skating this morning. I went skating yesterday. Yeah. It was the weekend before that. So I was skating then like I skate a bit. I, I skate a lot. I skate whenever yeah. I can, whenever my right. body okay. will allow me to. I'm just I will trying to skate. get a sense of like how much you're skating mixed in with teaching classes and sitting at your desk writing a novel and all. Okay. Right. So carry on back to whatever right. it is. But importantly, just to kind of like tweak what you just asked, like what I would most rather be almost any time I'm doing anything is out skating, like no matter what I'm doing, like with some slight caveats for certain experiences with my family and loved ones. Like I, I'm pretty <laughs> happy when I'm doing that. But like when I'm sitting down and writing, um, I would probably almost rather always almost rather be skating. Sure. So um, this the question started with... Uh, unpacking um yeah. like skateboarding and poetry are structurally meaningless great. and essentially non-narrative so what i found when i started like trying to do an audit of like well what the hell is this thing that i keep doing and keep not doing other things because i would rather be doing it what i discovered is that in fact it's a very strange thing um it's a it's a weird activity it resists in some key ways a lot of the sort of frameworks or systems that we have in place to understand things the most obvious of those being like sport like in some key ways skateboarding is not at all a sport but in some other key ways it's not exactly an art it's not exactly this other thing um and so it, it's weird it's slippery is what it, it it's sort of occurred to me eventually after staring at it for years and years on end it, it's a strange object um and the closest I can find to it in terms of an analog is poetry. Like, I think there's a real good argument that skateboarding is like dance. I, however, have no real access to understand dance or speak of dance with any sort of authority, right? Like, I have a few writers who I turn to who deal in performance, who I've learned, Matthew Goulish being the sort of top among those. Like, I've learned a lot about performance through him. Um, but that said, like the closest sort of analog I have to what skateboarding is, is poetry, which is to say it doesn't mean anything. It has no obligation to mean anything. It has no burden of time management and narrative. It has no sort of um, promise of meaning whatsoever. And in that sort of meaninglessness, it is allowed to be all of these things things which makes it vulnerable and so you will see like e the evangelical wing of the church using skateboarding to try to recruit people because like here's a way to stay off drugs or you will see like rock bands using skateboarding to show hey we're into drugs like it can be both and so that sort of extreme malleability and flexibility to me, it means that it's actually something that that is it's either up to nothing at all or it's up to some very, very interesting things. And I, you know, after looking at it long and hard, realized for me, at least it was the latter. It's up to some very, very interesting things. Yeah. OK, I love that answer. So I'm thinking about that as I want to ask you the second part of my narrative question, which is, OK, okay 
through across the book, you frequently and then I think kind of increasingly mention this in progress skateboarding novel, um, as I will call it. And mm -hmm. um, sort of one gets the sense, a reader gets the sense that this is becoming like one of those forever projects that's just kind of like mm -hmm. frustratingly perpetual. Um, and <laughs> as a fiction writer myself, like I completely understood that. And I was very, I felt very like cued into this part of, of the essays, a fall tracking this across the essays. Um, and I was always excited when it came back. And I was like, it, it was almost like a plot for me, a subplot. And I was like, what's mm -hmm. going to happen with the skateboarding novel? But it also just made me really think about how interesting it is to consider like a different kind of narrative space of the same material I'm reading. So I'm interacting with you, like your brain and skateboarding across this nonfiction space. But there's also this really tantalizing space that you're just kind of like teasing me with that's <laughs> you and your brain and skateboarding, but in a mm -hmm. fiction space. And so I, I have further questions about that. But just to start, I'm kind of curious what the difference is for you in writing about skateboarding, like about skateboarding yeah. in essays versus sort of like trying to interact with skateboarding in a, a fictional space. And I, I have a bunch of thoughts about it, but I just want to let you talk. First. Great. Um, no, I appreciate that. I think the the easiest answer is that it's it's just a it comes almost entirely down to form and expectation of the form, right? I mean, so all the stuff I just said about poetry, like the the important asterisk to all that is that I am not gifted as a poet, or have I grown up reading a lot of poetry, right? Like my sort of um, path has been more and more recently that that I'm getting closer to poetry and finally at this point in my life beginning to appreciate reading it. Um, I do not think that I will ever be gifted as a poet, um, but I, I would love by the time I die to be gifted at reading poetry. Um, I think the essay form is uh, the closest that I will ever come to attempting uh, poetry. Like I think what I discovered when I began seriously exploring the the essay, like capital T, capital E, um, is that it al it allows a certain level of freedom that maybe is twofold. And the first fold there is about time and narrative, right? Like what the great thing about the essay is, is that it doesn't have any obligation to move through time and create meaning by moving through time. Mm -hmm. um, that's wonderful. The second sort of freedom there is a personal one, which is I didn't decide at age 22, I'm going to be an essayist. What I decided at age 22 is I'm going to be a novelist because the novel is the form that defines America, you know, et cetera. Um, and so there's a kind of double freedom there for me in that for one thing, the essay is not something that I, I, I chose to pursue and is, as, exists as the sort of basis of my sense of value and success and how, have, how am I doing as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, but that other one, the sort of formal one, the sort of strictly non-personal formal one, I think is even more important because in the essay, I'm allowed to get closer to kind of a pure mimesis of what skateboarding is. That is to say, the movement of it, the repetition of it, um, the the iterations and the failures of it, right? I mean, an essay is, is allowed to, is encouraged to not provide answers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are some key ways where as a, a storyteller, I have, I, I'm not, extremely gifted. Like I'm not a great storyteller. If I'm good at telling stories, it's because I'm like a technician and I understand how story is supposed to work. Whereas when I sit down to write an essay, what I feel is like this empowered liberation to like, all right, where is this going to go? I'm going to follow it. I'm going to pursue it. I'm going to decide at this point to stop that thought and go over to this thought. And I feel kind of at home in the essay. And I've, I haven't really ever felt at home writing narrative. Like I, I, I'm not, I'm not a natural storyteller. I'm someone who understands how story works, but I'm not a natural storyteller. Yeah, me neither. But I, and I also don't think I'm someone who naturally understands how story works, but I feel really comfortable inside of a fictional space being like, now I'm going to stop that idea and go over here right, and right. like interested in repetition and failure. And so right. like, I really want to know what would happen if you wrote in a fictional space with that feeling of freedom 
So, so what what I will say here is having, you know, read your fiction and and taught your fiction and spent a lot of time actually explaining your fiction or talking with students about sprawl in particular, <laughs> like wh what you do and what I find so incredibly admirable about what you do is that you do embody that sort of authority and that sort of um, demand, that demand that fiction come along with what you're doing. I don't, I've never had that. And I think part of that gets into, and we don't have enough time to really get into this, like publishing, right? Like I have just, dis I decided early that what I wanted to do was write books that were published by big presses. Oh yeah. And that, that was a mistake. I, I can say that now. Like I can say that at age 43. You can let like, that go oh, at any time. Just let yeah, it go. I sure could. I totally could, but Danielle, like back to the book that I wrote, the novel, because it exists. This isn't like a, a notional thing that I put into the book, the the essay collection, so that I could have this sort of like white whale figure. Like that book is real, and that book is one that I gave to a dear friend at seven hundred pages, and he, God bless him, read it all and was like, "I love this. This book rules." And since then giving him that 700 page version, what I've done is twerk it and cut it and reduce it and tweak it and mold it to fit what I thought would sell in the market. And the market eventually said to me like, gosh, we don't want this either. And so what I've done is warped this totally weird, indulgent novel into this thing that no longer is something I totally believe in. Yeah. And that's not narrative's fault. That's publishing's fault. And that's my fault for believing in, in a certain kind of publishing. Um, but again, like what that led me to was, boy, I sure like writing essays. Like what an essay yeah. doesn't do is make me think I have to do this differently. And the essays are totally delightful. And the variety of them across the book is so lovely too. I mean, I actually have more narrative questions for you, but I'll stop because I'll just seem like a giant geek. But um, <laughs> although I, I am obsessed with this idea that you're trying to merge the energies of skateboarding with the energies of narrative. And I have like big ideas about what that could possibly mean. Um, but okay, so I was really interested in what you, how you described the book uh, right at the beginning about how there were these pieces. Well, there, there's pieces you wrote as like mm -hmm. criticism for magazines. And then you said the second half was more personal maybe. And I guess I did feel that moving through, but it felt more complicated than that to me. Yeah. Like, and I wonder if you could talk a tiny bit about how you took those um, pieces you've written for ma skateboarding magazines and like turned that all of that into a book. Like, yeah. how did you come up with the idea? And like, how did you shape it? Well, I think, I think along the way, um, my, my sort of uh, standard answer was that each of these standalone pieces of criticism was exactly that. Like they could each stand as a work of like essentially close reading, close reading, right? Like I'm going to do a close reading on this video. Um, what, what happened along the way is that I sort of realized that in fact, um, each of these pieces um, is is part of a bigger project. Like each one sort of grew from the one before it. Um, and so I think along the way, what I realized was that there was a sort of trajectory that each thing sort of needed the next step and the prior step so that I could kind of engage in what my publishing copy calls a quest, um, which I'm fine with. Like, I don't think that's totally wrong. Um, to try to figure out what exactly skateboarding was. And, you know, at a certain point, maybe about halfway through the decade, that became more and more personal. Um, and so, you you know, the newest writing in the book is the most personal writing in the book. Um, part four is, you know, to me, a kind of synthesis of the critical lens and um, something that feels very, very, very personal. Um, so in terms of making the book, like what it was, was here are the individual things now, um, comment on them a little bit and talk about where they came from and, and where I came from. And so, you know, again, like the thing with all this is, is that it, it all felt incredibly unified. Like it was, the, there were not forced labor. There was no contrivance. There was no time when I felt like, oh, now I must do this thing. Like my editor, God bless him, Wes Miller, skater, you know, at a certain point he was like, you should probably talk about your first skateboard. And I was like, oh, <laughs> But then the second I did it, I was like, oh, I can do this in a way that feels totally, totally right. Um, yeah, I love that piece. That's so cool that your editor is a skater. I mean, like, what are the odds? Um, what are yeah, the odds? It felt like uh, 
it felt really unified to me. I, I wondered when we started if it was going to feel like, um, like I was following your essays that you'd written for magazines and it would, we would just move chronologically through that. But I was really delighted at how much more complex the form of the book actually was. And I felt like there was this sort of present Kyle kind of seeing his way through the whole book and leading us to this much more, these more personal revelations at the end. Mm. Um, and okay, I, I just wanna actually remind everybody, I have one more question to ask and then like um, type your questions into the comments, everybody, and then um, Shane will be happy to ask them for you. Um, but I, I wanna, I actually have more questions if that, that winds up being needed. But one thing I did wanna ask you, to, to, like you talked about like the youth of the Olympics and, um, and Shane and you both have mentioned how you've been doing this for 30 years. Um, like what, what do you do with like this thing you've done since childhood and now mm -hmm. you're like, you know, in your forties. Um, and so I'm older than you. Um, but I really want to talk about middle age for just a second, um, because I have been a dancer my whole life. And that was one way mm. I did connect to some of the ways you talk about skateboarding, like in terms of the physical activity of skating, because honestly, like probably almost nothing makes me as happy as dancing. Like time ceases to exist you know and mm -hmm. it's just like being in my body in that way is so super important to me um but uh and being with other people dancing with other people but um i it hurts me a lot now like i feel a lot of physical pain when i dance and after i dance and i'm trying to figure out like what that means for me moving forward and a few times in the book you talk about this like as a kind of um, like existential like possibly coming existential crisis is like what is it going to mean for you when you can't skate anymore is that you and i just obviously you never answered this question in the book because you're not that old but um like, I just kind of wonder if you could say any more about that and like yeah. in not totally depressing ways, because I think there's got to be actually kind of cool ways to yeah. grow with these things. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a, that's a great and beautiful question, especially with the, the sort of like hard line on depressing, like don't be depressing. Um, so like, you know, dance is really important here. One can dance with a, with a, a torn ACL, like we have ways to dance and engage with music and rhythm. Um, we can find it. And it could be as simple as a head nod. It can be the sort of like finger dance that, you know, my mother, God bless her, is very good at. Like there are a lot of, there are a lot of ways to dance despite our body's um, limitations, right? I mean, the beauty of dance is that it's, there's, <laughs> there's no, there's no hard, fast limit on what constitutes a dance. Like if you think you're dancing, you're dancing. Um, and I would think something similar to that is going to probably give me a map for what skateboarding will do. Like if it means that what, what I do is stand on a board and, and push across a driveway enough that I can feel the kind of cracks of the asphalt or the cement or whatever it is under my feet, that's going to feel to me like skateboarding. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine that I will be skateboarding um, as long as I'm able to physically be upon a board. And what I would stress is that that doesn't even necess necessarily mean that I'm I can stand up. You know, I started skateboarding on my butt. You know, in the 1980s, I didn't know what skateboarding was, and I came into it sitting on my butt and going down the hill of Godwin Lane in Ladue. Um, you know that that was my that was my introduction to skateboarding. Um, and so, if it means that I'm in a chair and we rig up that chair to be sitting on some sort of platform with wheels, like I'm go I'm going to find a way to do that. Um, and you know, the 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 kind of beauty of all this is that we have. Um, now in 2021, we have so many, <laughs> so many models of adaptive athletics, right? I mean, we have skaters, um, who ha have found a way despite their physical, what we might call limitations to engage with skateboarding. And it's stunning. It's beautiful. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm not super concerned about it. Like, will I miss being able to Ollie and to kickflip and to do the sort of tricks that are important to me? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. but that's, that's not all of it. I don't think like you dance. 
Yeah, no, I mean, that was a great answer because you're right, like I need to get over myself because I dance pretty hard and I just have to chill out. That was a beautiful answer, so oh, thank thanks. you. Thank you. Hi, Shane. Hello, thank you so much for this really like enlightening and fun conversation. I admitted before the event that I don't know a ton about skateboarding and I do have my own question about uh, that comes from my kind of childhood as well. But we have some really incredible questions from audience members. Uh, right. One that I, I'm i not entirely certain what all the terminology is. So I hope you will maybe fill us in as well. Um, Great. Steven asks, on page 151, you write about a boy skateboarding. No, no, a boy, about a boy skating. If anything, his body affects a kind of death embrace. Mm. Do the desire and death drives present in skating affect the experience of the writer writing? Well, I guess general. Like, I thought death drives was like a move. <laughs> no. Oh, that's great. Um, so what the, thank you, Stephen, for pointing to one of two pieces in the book that's actually fiction. Um, so there, there are there are these two sort of pieces that are that I think of as as fictional works. Um, I think that sort of, I mean, what you're hearing in the language of the death drive is you're you're hearing me apply sort of like high end philosophical slash psychological Freudian um, sort of terminology to um, an activity that, for most of its history, has not been. Um, deemed worthy of those kind of um, kind of important terms, right? I mean, which which just to be clear, like I think is wrong. Like I think I think to not treat skateboarding as importantly as any other part of the humanities, as any other sort of um, practice, as any other uh, sort of lifelong pursuit. Um, is, is a failure. Like, I think that's a failure of the kind of popular imagination. Um, and so whether or not that death drive affects the writer, like, I mean, I think so. Like, I think Freud got a few things right. Um, I <laughs> maybe, uh, I, I think that I, I certainly have found in treating skateboarding seriously. I have found that, um, it has come with it, it, its own sort of set of pitfalls and challenges. Um, but again, like, you know, the, the idea here would be that um, if you're going to, if you're going to claim that a, a thing or an activity deserves to be spoken of, you need to commit to that. Um, and I've tried, I tried in that section to commit to that in a certain way. That's a hard question, man. That was super specific. Like I yeah, and big. bravo for the answer too, because that oh, was, thanks. Yeah. Um, and don't invent a move called death drives. <laughs> no, I, no, I think that's probably not a move for skateboarding. Um, Liz is asking, I have a question about dispatches from a skateboard life going on the cover. To Kyle's point about publishing, was that a requirement suggested positioning to help people identify this piece? Were you okay with it? It's obviously so much about skateboarding, but about so much more. So, so much more. Just so curious about how Kyle feels about it. Um, that's, a, that's a again, a very good question. Um, and because I've spoken well of my editor earlier, um, I, and he's a person I, I think very highly of, what I will say is that um, one of the realities of having this book released by a big press um, is that there are certain decisions that I have put on um, that are ultimately not my own decisions. Um, I would have preferred all things equal. My hope would have been to not need, not require a subtitle. Like that's it. Like, I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm selling anyone out by saying that. Like, I think the most fun thing to me would stand alone. Um, that said, I also recognize that um, by by entering into the sort of agreement of publishing, what I sign away 
is some control. Like that's, that's it. The, the, the book becomes an object. Um, and it always does, no matter what size publisher you're working with. Right. I mean, it always happens that, um, the book is going to be different than the, the thing that you've been working on. Um, the object is always going to be different. Um, what I can say is, as far as subtitles go, Dispatches from a Skateboarding Life is d incredibly fine. Like, just profoundly okay. I'm okay with it. Um, and, and you know, it, it, and we, we did. We did a lot of negotiating on title and subtitle and so on. Um, but, you know, I mean, they're all sort of their gradients of this sort of um, I want to call it a sacrifice, but really it's just a negotiation. You know, the publisher wants to sell your book to as many people as possible and make it as, um, as marketable as they can. You as the author, no matter who you're dealing with, whether it's Dorothy, God bless Dorothy or Hachette or, you know, a random house penguin slash random house. Um, you are, you are going to you are always going to come upon a situation where your vision is going to, in some way, butt up against the realities of the people who need to sell the thing. And that's it. Um, this wasn't a high friction situation. I was pretty okay with how it went. Um, though that said, were, were we living in a utopic world, there would be no subtitle. It would just be the most fun thing. That's it. And I mean, I, as a reader, love to be surprised by books that kind of generally I wouldn't pick up. And right. I think that something about skateboarding, I I don't know if I would be drawn to it if it had a different subtitle or a different mm. title. But the yeah. combination of the two, I'm like, OK, like I and then like it's intriguing enough. And then I read the description of the book and I'm like, I think I would actually really enjoy this. So do you do you? Thank you. Do you know the book Dispatches by Michael Hare, the the sort of like postmodern Vietnam book? Oh, it's such a good book and it's so weird. So there was something about that word dispatch that I think won me over in any case. All right. So we do still have time for more audience questions. So audience watching, if you type those up, but now I get to ask my question. Um, so my hometown growing up, I don't know if anyone actually skateboarded. Um, there were a lot of rules around town, like through the downtown area, through the university in our town, like all sorts of signs posted saying like skateboarding, not allowed on campus, mm -hmm. um, which I think possibly still exist. Um, so I'm wondering now that you actually work on a campus and that's kind of where this <laughs> thought came from, uh what your what the rationale is behind towns doing things like this and making skateboarding seem so like i mean this is midwestern like small town missouri i mean not terribly small because we had a university but still like why do you think they were doing this and causing so much stigma against skateboarding skateboarders I think that's, I mean, I think that's a big question. I think it has a lot to do with um, the way that in the U.S. we treat public space. Um, so, and, and I'm going to try to keep this short because I know that we're, this is one of those questions that could be a 30 minute question. So I'm going to try to bracket it in some key ways. Um, we, we, we hold on to the idea in the US, we hold on to the idea um, that that which we build is that which sh should um, exist free from any sort of interaction with sort of frictions um, mm -hmm. or collisions um, that the world actually requires, right? I mean, we, we view um, graffiti as just the, the most disrespectful thing in the world. Um, we also believe that any piece of concrete bench or ledge that exists in the world should not be touched um, by a skateboard's nose or a truck or the wax that is required for a skateboarder to make that ledge into a fun thing. Like we, we, we have this idea that the behavior is the illicit thing. 
Um, and the object itself, the wall where people might write graffiti, those are kind of held as sort of sacred. So there's not this sort of basic sense that when we put a thing into the world, that thing then is an invitation to be interacted with. Like we don't have that sort of idea in the U.S., nor do we really believe that public space is the place for people to behave publicly. I mean, we have very kind of rigid guidelines of what goes on in a park, what goes on in a city plaza, what goes on in a public fountain. Like you don't let your dog in there. Absolutely not. Um, we have ideas of how this is supposed to work. Um, there was a time when for, for a while there was an idea that a skater who hurts themselves on private property um, could conceivably sue the owner of that property. You've probably heard that, right? Like that was, that was a sort of built in argument that has almost never happened. There are maybe, there are a handful of cases of that ever happening in the history of private property in the United States of America. And yet it is the argument that was thrown out over and over again about you can't skateboard here because if you get hurt, you could sue us. Um, never, almost never. I mean, maybe there are three or four cases of skaters actually suing property managers. Um, and so I think when you take that sort of, um, boogeyman of litigation and you mix that with an American approach to public space, um, which isn't really committed to publicness or spatiality at all. Um, I think what you end up with is a real suspicion for those who would engage in any behavior that could even be seen possibly as illicit. Like, it's important to note that that's not the case if you go to anywhere in Scandinavia, that you can skate a ledge in a public park in Scandinavia and there will be two people there having a conversation who are unbothered by you doing it. It's just kind of seen as, well, this is public space. We happen to be sitting here drinking coffee and talking. You happen to be using this ledge as a skate spot. And there is a coexistence there. Um, but that's not what you find in the U.S. Like in the U.S., it's seen as this sort of um, grave insult that we would skaters would try to do, try to use public space publicly. It's tough. It's sneaky. And it's not, it's not surprising for America. Um, but it also, it doesn't have to be that way. And I think there's a lot of room for growth in this country toward that. That's a, ew, yeah. Do any of your essays go into they detail. do. There's an essay in the book, late in the book, about the um, the giant Picasso statue in Chicago, um, which is just a totally indestructible, cannot be harmed by skateboarding or anyone, and b um, was donated by Pablo himself to the people of Chicago to use as they would see fit, and c exists in a place that is the tight security you will find anywhere in the city for trying to skate. I was there the other day and I got one try at a trick. Um, it was probably about 45 seconds before security was out there pouncing on us. Um, so yeah, I get into it a little bit there. Uh, I don't know if we have time for this question, but we'll try. Um, okay. So Steven asks another question that said, when you think about the literal stage of the skateboard as a platform, that is performed mm -hmm. upon, at what point does the platform cease to be the skateboard and turn into the obstacle itself? Oh man, that's beautiful. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to have to answer that very briefly and, and in a way that is going to feel really unsatisfying to me. Um, and I'm going to have to draw on a, uh, a sort of academic term here and say that I think actually it's a really dialectical relationship. Um, and that in fact, like what, what the skateboard ends up being is is both stage um, and obstacle. Like that's that's kind of the beauty of it, and that's one of the slippery realities of what skateboarding is. It is a it is a venue for performance, and it is also um, the, the sort of uh, greatest obstacle to the performance that you're trying to engage um, with with an invitation. Stephen, if you want to talk more about this, please reach out because I'm always happy to talk about it. But I know that if I start answering this in any deep way, I'm going to go for just <laughs> 30 to 45 minutes. So thank you for that question. And let's talk about it. Hit me up. 
Uh, I want to thank you both so much for doing this event. Kyle, it is a pleasure to meet you. I know that you uh, did an event for the um, for your novel. I hope that we yeah. are do another event for you again soon because I saw pictures of that event. Uh, Danielle, such a pleasure. Really, I just I miss getting to see you. Uh, <laughs> reminder. We have copies of Most Fun Thing available for sale at Left Bank Books. I did share a link in the comments twice now, uh, so you can get yourself a signed copy. Zoom in. Uh, so you can have that sent to you anywhere in the country. You can come into the store, find it on our front table. You can call whatever is most convenient for you to buy a copy of that book from Left Bank Books. I did also share a copy of or the link for Danielle Dutton's Margaret the First, which is perpetually on our shelves as well. Uh, so you can order a copy of that too, if you are so inclined. And oh, your mom just said hi. I know. <laughs> Terry, God bless her. She should read Margaret the First. We're gonna get Terry a copy of Margaret the First. She'll love yeah. it. Uh, and also a big thanks to the audience. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, and we hope to see you again really soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shane. Thank, Thank you, you Kyle. Frank. Thank you, Danielle. This was wonderful. I hope to see you again My pleasure. soon. Congratulations on the book. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks.